let's turn to Byzantine Lent. Byzantine Lent, 48 days. It's six weeks long, but the Byzantines understand it as there's Lent and then there's Holy Week. And technically, Holy Week is distinct from Lent. I've heard Romans nowadays talk like that. I don't think that's the way it was traditionally understand, like in the time of Leo the Great or Gregory the Great, but this is definitely how the Byzantines came to understand it. Now, Romans don't count Sundays, but Byzantines don't count Saturdays and Sundays. So their Lent is a little bit longer. They have a pre-Lent time as well. In the Roman Rite, it's called the Jessimas or the Shrove Tide. Some people call it pre-Lent. I like Shrove Tide. That's the old English way of saying it. Shrove or shrift refers to confession. It's time to confess and get confess our sins and go into Lent. So that's why the three Sundays in pre-Lent are called Shrove Tide in traditional English. In the Byzantine, everywhere I read, they call it pre-Lent. So they have Zacchaeus Sunday. This is more Slavic. Then they have 70 days till Easter is marked the publican and the Pharisee Sunday. These are marked by the gospel lessons. Then the next Sunday is prodigal Sunday, 63 days till Easter. Then the next week is called meat fair Sunday. This is 56 days till eat fair. It's called meat fair because on this Sunday is the last day you can eat meat. So they're, they're kind of grading you off there's like a little bit of a, a withdrawal period with the meat and then the next sunday is called cheese fair sunday or forgiveness sunday and this is when you give up cheese and dairy so you've been weaned off the meat and now you're weaned off the cheese and the dairy and then the day after cheese fair sunday boom it's called clean monday that's like their ash wednesday that's the first day of Lent, Clean Monday. And that whole week is called Clean Week. And it's the spring cleaning of your soul. It's super intense. In fact, um, I want to share this with you. So um, only two meals on the first first week of Lent, there's only two meals in the Byzantine Rite that are eaten. If you, if you do it strict, like the monks, you don't eat Monday anything. You don't eat Tuesday anything. You don't eat anything Wednesday until Wednesday night. There's the liturgy of the priest sanctified, and then you have your first meal. That's a long time without food. So they start Lent with no food on Monday, no food on Tuesday, and no food on Wednesday until supper time. That's impressive. That's impressive. Okay, so that's the first week. And then they have the first Sunday is called the Triumph of Orthodoxy. This is commemorating the first seven ecumenical councils. And the seventh council was the Triumph of the Icons. And so they process with the Icons. It's awesome. Go look at pictures online. I should have got one. The next Sunday is St. Gregory Palamas. He is the saint of mystical, quiet prayer, the Hesychist movement. Um, of course, in the West, with Thomas, with Thomas, a little bit controversial on the uh, essence energies distinction. It's a whole other debate. Interestingly, Eastern Catholics, of course, uh, celebrate this. Third Sunday, veneration of the cross. Fourth Sunday, Saint John Comacus, Saint John of the Ladder. Fifth Sunday, Saint Mary of Egypt, who was a uh, a prostitute, a very lewd woman who had a, a deep conversion and became a great saint she's a sign of repentance of the most people so far from god coming back so close to god the sixth sunday just like in the roman rite is palm sunday and then you have holy monday holy tuesday holy wednesday holy thursday or monday thursday good friday and holy saturday now what are the byzantine fasting rules well it's just like the old Roman rite. No land mammals of the meat. No birds. Can't have their products. No dairy, no cheese, no butter, no eggs. But they also restrict fish, 
which the Roman Rite doesn't, and wine in oil, olive oil, for cooking. This means you're having no meat, no animal products, no dairy, no cream, no butter, no oil. You're basically eating leaves, fruit, vegetables, and nothing that is pan sautéed in oil. This, my friends, is pretty hardcore and it's still on the books to this day. Now, on weekdays in the second through the six weeks, the strict fasting rule is kept every day. No meat, no meat products, no fish, no eggs, no dairy, no wine, no oil. On the Saturdays and Sundays during Lent, wine and oil are allowed, but everything else is off the table. So on Saturdays and Sundays, you get to relax a little bit, and yeah, you get to eat some peas and carrots, but you get to saute them in the oil, and you get to have some wine. Now during Holy Week, I'll read this. The Thursday evening meal is I, ideally the last meal taken until Sunday. This is like in the Roman Rite. There's a bit of reprieve. In the Eastern Rite, wine and oil are allowed for that dinner on Maundy Thursday, Holy Thursday. And then Good Friday is the strictest fast of the whole year. Even those who haven't been really keeping Lent in the Eastern tradition, on this day, they don't eat. All right, this is the fast. The fast. On Holy Saturday, there's so much liturgy going on from the morning until late at night. They do have a little bit of wine allowed them. And then they finally break fast entirely at Resurrection Matins, which happen, I believe, around midnight, late in the night. All right, one thing we noticed between the Roman and the Eastern over time is the Roman sees this as law or legality. And they're like, you know, people can't do this in this region, so let's reduce it. Let's let them have dairy. That was one of the first concessions. Wine and dairy were given back and oil. And then, okay, well, let's let them eat eggs, right? And so over time, the Romans, the Roman Catholic Church, cut down their penance. So by the time you get to the 1960s, you only have two fasting days per year. Ash Wednesday and Good Friday, and by fasting they mean one full meal and two snacks that don't add up to one meal and no meat on those two days. You compare that to what the Byzantines do, and it doesn't, it's just, it's mind blowing. Now, in the Eastern Church, in the Byzantine format, they always kept the highest extreme ideal. It's like standing at the foot of a mountain and looking up and someone saying, are you ready to climb that mountain and go stand on top? And you're thinking, no, there's no way I can reach the summit of this mountain. And then you do your best. There's the ideal, which we all strive for, but then even at the end of Lent, the Eastern Christians recognize, look, even the most hardcore ascetic monk amongst us didn't keep Lent entirely perfect. There was weakness. There was sickness. There was concessions. There was fatigue. There was temptation. But the important thing is, is we strive for the ideal. So maybe you can't fast until 3 p.m. Can you fast till 10 a.m.? Okay, maybe you don't give up all dairy and cheese and eggs, but maybe you do just give up butter. So in other words, in the, in the Eastern tradition, you talk to your priest and he kind of challenges you. He doesn't want to set you up for failure, but he says, okay, here's the ideal, right? How far up do you think is reasonable based on your age, your physical handicaps, whatever's going on in your life? Are you a day worker where you're laboring all day in a factory or are you working on a computer all day and typing with your fingers? So here's the ideal and let's just try to figure out what's best for you. Because there is no, I'm not going to do anything for Lent in the Eastern. 
Maybe it's like, okay, well, you're going to fast till 9.30 a.m., something. Whereas in the, in the West, we're kind of like, well, if you're above this age and you're below this age, you don't have to do anything. And if you have any of these medical conditions, don't do anything, et cetera. Personally, as I, as I spent time looking at each of these traditions, I have to say I admire the Byzantine 